Good evening. I propose the affirmative proposal, which would establish a national carbon market based on the guidelines of ACES, or the American Clean Energy and Security Act. I will give reasons as to why the affirmative plan of action would not work, as well as disadvantages that would result from the adoption of their plan. There are three main reasons why we, the opposition, believe that their proposal will not work. Number one, climate change is known to be a natural process. Therefore, it would be difficult to accurately estimate the amount of greenhouse gases attributed to human activity. Greenhouse gases are released naturally, making it difficult to trace sources to polluters and regulate activity through a market system. Number two, if a market were established, it would be difficult to ensure compliance. There are examples, as previously mentioned, of cap and trade systems that have failed to lower greenhouse gas levels due to enforcement issues. Number three, the goal of regulating greenhouse gases through a national market system is too problematic. States such as California have already adopted emissions reduction targets through legislation. Undertaking the process on a national level is not feasible. The bill did not pass in the Senate for good reason. Many senators were concerned with effects such as carbon pricing. To address my first claim, that climate change is a natural process, I will point out that scientists have not been able to determine how much human activity has actually contributed to the phenomena of global warming. A report issued by the Environmental Policy Project at the Hudson Institute shows that the current warming cycle is not unusual. Warming cycles every 1,500 years will continue regardless of human activity, as evidenced by a variety of fossil-based findings and ice core samples. The EPA is already taking action to mitigate known sources of emission, but scientific research is inconclusive in terms of the exact amount of greenhouse gas emissions attributed to the burning of fossil fuels and other activities. Imposing a market on companies to reduce emissions is futile if the cause of climate change is natural and unavoidable. The Cato Institute, in its seventh edition of its Handbook for Policymakers, states that there is no scientifically credible model to predict future warming and derive amounts of emissions due to human activity. None of the International Panel on Climate Change's models project warming through the middle of the next decade. Therefore, drastic action for climate change is unwarranted at this time. If the cause of global warming is due only in part to human activity, why should the government focus, focus its efforts on battling an issue that is just part of a greater natural cycle of global warming and cooling? Capping emissions to protect human health is a more realistic goal than the reversal of global warming trends. Thus, science has conclusively shown that pollutants can have serious health effects. I would like to point out that while carbon is the most ubiquitous greenhouse gas, as previously mentioned, it is not harmful to human health. The US EPA, under its health effects advisory statements, warns that smog and ground level ozone, as well as particulate pollution, are the most harmful to human health and can cause severe respiratory illnesses. In comparison, carbon is innocuous and has not been proven to have ill effects. I'll now move on to my second claim, which is that compliance would be difficult to establish under a new policy of cap and trade. It is inevitable that companies functioning under these guidelines would find ways to evade regulation. The same has happened with taxation. Corporate tax loopholes are rampant, and the government constantly expends considerable resources to force compliance. A 2009 article from The Economist shows that cap and trade would create loopholes, allowing for huge increases in offsets which are when polluters pay someone else to stop polluting for them instead of curbing their own emissions. There are grounds to believe that this policy would be abused based on what is happening under the European law. In the EU, exploitative factories have started to pollute just so that someone will pay them to stop. Exacting new regulations on carb carbon is problematic because so much is released naturally through biological processes and is not harmful to human health. Other more dangerous compounds have already been lowered over more than 40 years of policy readjustment under the Clean Energy Act, as Christian already mentioned, and no longer pose a significant threat to human health. If these reasons for establishing a carbon market are eliminated, why should the federal government go to the effort to create a brand new system that will inevitably result in corporate cheating and require vigilant scrutiny? It is important to question the motives of the proponents advocating for this new market as well. In 2007, a report issued by Friends of the Earth, which is an environmental watchdog group, an alarming parallel was drawn between the proposed carbon industry and the failed mortgage lending industry. The report stated, the subprime mor mortgage crisis was generated by questionable loans and the failure of market checks and balances. A cap and trade program could face similar questions. Some of the most visible recent carbon offset scandals have included the construction of dams, 
where builders were going to construct anyway, allowing companies to claim double credits. HFC destruction projects where factories deliberately created dangerous greenhouse gases in order to destroy them and therefore make pro pro profit off of the credits. And forest related carbon reduction schemes where trees were planted to store carbon and earn credit only to die several years later. Establishing a carbon market reserved to enrich predatory companies. The government is already regulating dangerous pollutants on behalf of the public and does not need a middleman to regulate carbon through trading at the expense of the taxpayer. My third and final claim is that pricing carbon nationally is problematic. Who is to decide carbon's price through provisions for trading? Not only can prices fluctuate, causing economic instability, but companies can also engage in destructive practices such as hoarding pr pollution permits. A 2009 memorandum submitted but to Greenpeace by a research group Point Carbon found that carbon price is the main vehicle for generating emissions reductions in a cap and trade market. The pricing mechanism is effective only because it is intended to impact polluters and consumers, passing on the cost of carbon to them. The policy outlined in the Waxman Markley or ACES bill, however, shielded consumers and polluters from pricing and therefore was ineffective. In the meantime, States and regions have been developing strategies to limit emissions and adapt to rising utility costs by enacting their own policies. My partner and I um, would like to mention California's AB32 and SB375, which are an Assembly Bill and Senate Bill. These have set reduction targets for the state. These actions have addressed regional linkages for housing, transportation, and energy efficiency without pricing carbon or subscribing to any kind of national policy. Embracing the uncertainty principle and allowing states and regions to continue their current emissions policies without pricing carbon is an equally effective strategy. <coughs> Hesitating to act federally in this instant, instance is prudent. States are already generating effective policies that address the need to establish energy independence, create resilient economies, generate local jobs, and reduce pollution, which are all meeting the stated goal of the 